Hi, Tigers. Welcome to Stay Homecoming Week. I'm Jenna Mills, the Director of Alumni Engagement Programs and a proud 2009 and 2016 graduate of Towson University. Thank you for joining us today for the History of TU Homecoming with TU Archives Associate Felicity Knock. Joining me today from the TU Alumni Relations team to help with this presentation is Steve Rosenfeld, Director of Alumni Communication and Recognition. This year's virtual Stay Homecoming has added many new and exciting elements to our week of events, like meeting our alumni right where they are. Today, we have alumni from 1963 to 2016 joining us from states like Maryland, New York, Virginia, and Pennsylvania. We are happy to have you with us so we can continue to celebrate our Tiger Pride and all the reasons why we bleed black and gold. Before I introduce Felicity, I want to share a few housekeeping notes. Attendees will remain muted throughout the webinar, but if you have any questions, we love to hear from you. And please use the chat function in your window and direct your question to all participants. We will, of course, monitor the chat throughout the discussion, um, and Felicity will answer questions at the end of her presentation. I'd now like to introduce Felicity Knox, a 1994 TU graduate. Felicity is the Library Associate in the Special Collections and Archives Department in Towson University's Albert S. S. Cook Library. Felicity began, began her career at TU in 2000 and joined the Archives Department in 20, 2009. Felicity assists researchers, works with students, writes articles for the Archives blog, and runs the department's social media platforms. Felicity is an author of the book, Towson University, The First 150 Years, a photo book celebrating Towson University's founders and rich history in conjunction with the 150th anniversary celebrations of TU. And if you haven't participated in one of Felicity's presentations before, well, you are really in for a treat today. Her presentations are always a fan favorite and I learn something new every time. Felicity, thank you so much for joining us today. Hi, technical difficulties. Thank you, Jenna. That was very kind of you. I'm going to share my screen and hope that when I do that, it looks great for to you and that um, that is the last of the technical difficulties that I will encounter. <laughs> so um, I am always delighted to work with the alumni folks because they are so welcoming and warm and so it's a real privilege to once again be here with all of you. Um, as we know, I'm going to be talking about uh, homecoming and how it's really evolved as Towson itself has grown. Um, we think of it now as like a week long event with a big game day. Um, but at the start of homecoming, um, it was very different. And I think that that is a really interesting story in and of itself. So in this photo that we have um, here on this first slide, this is from the 1970 homecoming. And this is a gentleman named Harry Caples is in the back of the car. And he's a member of the class of 1900. Um, when he was a student here, and even when he was a recent graduate, we didn't have a homecoming. So uh, it's interesting that he is participating in this. Um, so I'm going to talk about how homecoming started, and then how it restarted, and then how homecoming evolved, and then uh, what the current homecoming traditions are to some extent. But I want you to just know that this is not exhaustive. Um, I am really, my super secret talent is being able to look at the uh, sort of the overview of things. And so trying to uh, just see how the big picture items and how things uh, came to be. So if I miss something, I'm a little, you know, the class of 1963, um, I might <laughs> miss a few things. And I will also be honest, in the midst of a pandemic, trying to get to all of the resources to tell this story has been a little bit of a challenge. So I want to make sure that um, I keep everybody included and that uh, if I do miss something, please feel free to, to chat about it. If you think there's something that I that we really need to know, that's great. Okay, so um, believe it or not, we are coming close to the 100th anniversary of the very first homecoming. Um, it looked very different from how it looks today, although the aims of the event were really very similar, and that was to bring alumni back to campus. So I like to start these discussions, I like to ground them in uh, some data. And so here are the enrollment numbers. Um, it's a, I know it can be a little tricky to see, but um, I'll tell you that this says 123 students in uh, 1866. And then by the end of 1933, 
um, we have 371. So uh, I always think enrollment is a great barometer to tell us what's happening on campus. So when Harry was in school, in 1900, we were at the Maryland State Normal School, and um, let's see, that's around here. So it's about 300 students. Um, the enrollment was very small. Uh, the school was still at the Carrollton Building, which is downtown in Baltimore, sort of West Baltimore near Lafayette Park, um, and it had less than 400 students enrolled, really, for most of the time that it was down there. Uh, it's important to keep in mind that until the 1930s, the program was actually a two year program. So everything that was part of the students experience at MSNS was crammed into those very short 24 months less, you know, minus the summers and creating a culture where students felt deeply about not only their classmates, but about their alma mater had to be a real challenge. So in 1915 that challenge eased when the Maryland State Normal School moved to Towson, the Towson campus. Uh, this was the first time that the school actually had dormitories. Um, so this is actually a picture of just Newell, it's before Richmond, so it's before 1924. Um, and it's the first time that students lived on campus, so that meant that those relationships really began to deepen. Um, Five years after we made this move to Towson, Lattie Tall became the school leader, which was at that time called the principal, and she instituted a lot of social changes, including starting the school newspaper, which is where I got most of my information about homecoming. But you can see these are student, these are classes um, at the time. This is a band, and then this is actually a student birthday party that was being held in the probably the um, downstairs in the Newell dining hall. So the first mention we have of homecoming shows up in the student newspaper, which was then called the Oriole in December of 1922. Um, the class of 1922, who you know just graduated that previous spring, came back to campus to meet with current students to share what they learned in their time as new teachers. And after the experience meeting, as it was called, they shared lunch and then everyone celebrated with some music and dancing in the auditorium. So this is, I mean, those of us who Think of campus, this is the bottom picture is Stevens Hall, that the auditorium at Stevens Hall. And then the top picture is uh, an entrance into the Newell Dining Hall, um, so decorated for a party. I always find balloons before helium kind of funny. Um, so this program established in 1922 was replicated for the next few years with some tweaks here and there. The previous spring's graduates would come back and spoke to would come back and speak to the current students about their work in the field. And then there were some social aspects like lunches or dinner, and then there would be card games or dancing. And in 1928, the women's field hockey team actually played a game as part of the homecoming program. Uh, what's notable about this is that I think this is also the first year that the male, male students had enough numbers to actually field a soccer team. So we assume that homecoming continued in this quiet way throughout the 1930s, even though the insert, through the uncertainty of the depression, the Great Depression. Lida Lee Tall left campus in 1938 and was replaced by M. Teresa Wiedefeld, who was herself a graduate of the school. She graduated in 1904. And Wiedefeld continued many of the things that had been begun by Tall. So it's, it's likely that there was some sort of homecoming by that, uh, during that time. But uh, the U.S.'s entry into World War II in December of 1943 changed a lot of the norms on campus and homecoming could not be continued. Not only were there fewer students on campus, we dropped below 300 students during the war years, but many of the alumni were actually off serving in the war as well. So four years after the war ended, the school created a much more formal homecoming event that had echoes of the original event. Alumni were invited back to campus for professional seminars, as well as meetings with faculty. They were invited to share meals and they had student um, events like soccer games and plays, which were offered as entertainment for those who returned to campus. And here we have men's soccer is the focal point of the, of the whole event. So 1949 was considered the first official homecoming event. What began that year was built upon the years, upon, built upon in the years that followed. Um, a new school president had taken office in 1948, so the year prior, and he saw the opportunity that homecoming offered not just for students and alumni, but for the school itself. So again, let's look at our enrollment numbers because I love data. 
Um, this is from the time when the school had transitioned to a four year program and was known as the State Teachers College at Towson. And you can see the dip from the war years, it's right around here. And then once that ends, the enrollment begins a steady climb. And um, with that enrollment comes, you know, more male students due to the GI Bill. And so that is certainly an, uh, something that the school has to take into consideration. Um, and so in 1950 and 1951, the program that was created in 1949 was offered again with one important difference, and that was promotion of the school's growth. So in this 1950 photo, President Hawkins was placing a time capsule in the cornerstone of one of the new men's dormitories that was under construction. Those were Ward and West Hall, um, which has since been transitioned into our health and uh, our counseling center um, facility. Um, so this was one of the year, the events that um, they promoted for homecoming for that year. Um, and then the following year, the dormitories were complete. So it was only natural that the homecoming celebrations would include the dedication of those two halls. Um, let's see, in 1952, my slide, whoops, whoops, see, oh, you know, technology. Okay, so in 1952, there is a sea change in the whole event. Um, students who have been serving as like these entertainment pieces for alumni who returned to campus for those first three years. Um, they were sort of a backdrop for alumni who were, you know, there for lunches and seminars. They were actually invited to participate. So um, as the October 29th Tower Light reported, homecoming in previous years has been exclusively for alumni, but this year it has been suggested that the entire student body participate. Yay, we all get to be part of it. So the events expanded to include an archery contest by uh, the students who were in the Women's Athletic Association, a contest for a best decorated dorm, and a parade of cars along York Road. Um, and this was the year that we crowned our first homecoming queen, and her name was Peggy White Leather. And after she was voted into the office by her fellow students. So you can see in the tower light, they have you know, 14 candidates and they're all, the students would all vote on who they thought would be the best queen. Um, and so I think at this time, the Alumni Association president was often the one who actually crowned the queen. So then in 1953, uh, 6,000 invitations were sent to alumni and students who had graduated at, well, sorry, and students who had graduated in 1885 were supposed to attend, like that's kind of wild to me. But they all, many of the events had to be canceled due to a surprise blizzard that actually blanketed the area. So that didn't stop students though because they had been waiting to have their first homecoming dance. Um, and they created this theme called Old Heidel Heidelberg. So it was this old Germany idea. And it was considered an informal dance. So you didn't have to like put on like your fanciest gown or whatever. Um, and they it was held from 9 p.m. until midnight in the old Wiedefeld Gymnasium, which is uh, where Cook Library now stands, the new Cook Library stands. That was where the uh, gymnasium had been. Um, I do wonder how those poor musicians down at the bottom felt about having to travel through the weather, but maybe they were really grateful for the gig. Who knows? So again, we're doing a year by year in this time because in 1954, there's this multi-day celebration. Um, it becomes a packed weekend affair. So on Friday, there's a bonfire and a pep rally and a jam session for the students. And then on Saturday, again, the Women's Athletic Association hosts a tournament. Um, there's another parade, uh, performances from the Glee Club, a one-act play, and then a soccer game. And then, of course, on Saturday, there's the dance. Um, Graduates of the school are still invited to participate, and there are still efforts to offer professional development for alumni and current students, but those things start to take a back seat to the, um, at least as far as the tower light coverage goes. So I'm not really sure if there was more than what current students were enjoying. Um, so on Sunday, because it is more than two days, it was actually Sunday they promoted a morning chapel service, which was sponsored by the campus religious organizations. That is the only mention I see um, in all of the time of uh, the homecomings that they talk about making sure you go to church the day after. So in the 1960s, they took what had been started in the previous decade. And so there's a lot, right? We've, we've really, we've 
expanded it greatly. And we started to hone what would become our traditional homecoming events. Um, so this tower light uh, front page from 1961 exemplifies what that would look like for the next decade. Um, I really am very curious about what a snake line is. Um, I'm assuming it's like a conga line. Uh, so <laughs> it says it's traditional snake line. I don't know what that means. Maybe somebody will enlighten me. Um, so students continue to focus on events like the bonfire and the soccer game, as well as the crowning of the homecoming queen. And after years of various nicknames, uh, things like teachers, sounds really very scary, knights, profs, gold and white. Uh, in November of 1962, the student senate voted that the official mascot for Towson should be the tiger. Um, this happened after a two-year campaign by various student athletes who wrote, wrote columns in the tower light. Um, during the 1963 homecoming parade, Mr. Tiger, as he was known then, made his first appearance. Obviously, we were on more formal terms 60 years ago, and he hadn't yet gotten his PhD. Um, so Lou Winkleman, one of the Tiger's staunch advocates, had rented a Tiger costume to wear in the parade. Uh, the costume doesn't have, in the photos, it doesn't have hands, uh, like gloves or um, feet, shoes. Um, so it's a little startling because he's usually in, like, you see his sneakers at the bottom and his hands. Um, so, but we've been the Tigers ever since. So um, after 22 years as president, uh, Hawkins retired in 1969, and he was replaced by James Fisher. Uh, Fisher was very young, and he was taking on a school that had been rapidly changing since that tiger had been named our mascot. So, you know, it's time for an enrollment check. Um, in 1963, the State Teachers College became Towson State College. Uh, this name at first might seem like we were just swapping letters around, but in reality, it was revolutionary. Teachers colleges in Maryland transformed into liberal arts schools, which meant that students could now get degrees in something other than education. Uh, the state recognized that the baby boom meant more openings in higher ed were needed, and they did it by changing the mission of the teachers colleges. For Towson, this meant that our enrollment began to skyrocket. It's probably, again, hard to see the numbers that um, are on the screen maybe, um, but at the bottom left-hand corner, we were just under 3,000 students in 1963, and by the fall of 1975, 12 years later, we are over six, oh, 14,000 students. Um, so this incredible um, change in enrollment had an impact on homecoming too. So Doc Minigan had been exploring the possibility of creating a football program since the early 1960s. The reality, however, was that while the school focused on teacher education, not many men would enroll. But when the school becomes a liberal arts school, the population of male students increases, which helps create the possibility to field a football team. So it took a few more years, but in the fall of 1969, the football team debuted and football became the focus of the homecoming celebrations. In 1971, Sheila Jefferson was crowned homecoming queen, and she's the first black student to win the title. The school had been integrated since 1954's Brown versus Board of Education Supreme Court decision, but it hadn't really made great strides in truly diversifying the campus. Uh, by 1969, steps had been put into place to better support black students on campus, including the establishment of the Black Student Union, the African American Cultural Center, the Black Faculty and Administrators Association, and the Towson Opportunity Program, which was the predecessor of today's Center for Student Diversity. So in 1976, the school name changed again, and we are now known as Towson State University. Um, the university status compelled us to try and elevate all parts of campus, and this included our sports offerings. The final change that occurred in the 1970s to homecoming was the construction of Minigan Stadium, which we now know, know as United Stadium. Not only did the stadium offer a permanent home for football, which had been playing on a too small field, like it was literally too small, it didn't have all the right yards in it, uh, near Burdick Hall for almost 10 years, it offered a lot of parking lots for those who would attend the game. And for homecoming, Parking lots means space to tailgate. And so at this point, just so you know, the minimum legal drinking age in Maryland for beer and wine in this 
1978 was 18, but it would soon change. Fisher left the university in 1978 before he could see that stadium host really host its first games, and he was replaced a year later by Hope Smith. Smith would work to balance the academic pursuits of the school with the students' desires for the college experience. So as for homecoming, there was definitely a growing feeling that the event was for resident students, particularly those involved in Greek organizations. Alumni didn't intend didn't attend in droves, and there didn't seem to be anything to draw commuters. But in 1980, the Towson University marching band was made official and took the field for the first time. So when bands played before this, they were hired by the school from area high school. And to get a band was a lot more complicated than saying, hey, you, with a tuba, let's start a marching band. Um, in 1973, students met at one of the local bars uptown, and they would wind their way down to the field at Burdick. Again, that's too short field to play during the halftime show of football games but they were pretty ramshackle and often quite drunk. I mean, they met at a bar. Um, a Tower Light article in 1976 call, recalled that the highlight of the performance was seeing the band collapse at the end of their final number, like right on the field. So ultimately the school had to like agree to give students instruments, uniforms and credits to participate. And then they also had to hire a band director. So that process really starts in 1978. And so it takes a couple of years for them to actually have a formal band. So today our band is just as much a draw to many as the football game itself. By 1973, people begin to question why only women are allowed to run as homecoming royalty. Um, I think that I've read, but I was having a really hard time finding it. So if anybody knows if this is true, I think I read that there was, there were men who like would jokingly run as homecoming queen um, to just to sort of, you know, take a dig at the whole practice. Um, and the argument evolved from why aren't um, men allowed to how sexist the practice seemed. So not many people participated in the voting at the time. And the year before, when the queen was announced, uh, it was reported that people booed, which seems really not nice at all. So I don't know if they were booing the practice, which is what I choose to believe as opposed to the choice. Um, so in 1984, they start this new idea, and it's called TSU's um, Outstanding Man and Woman of the Year. And so they're basically um, based on academic distinction and not the popularity of a vote. Um, okay, so thinking back to what I said about the drinking age, 1984 was also the year that the minimum drinking age was raised to 21 for all alcohol, not just beer and not just hard liquor. Um, so, and that's a national um, law, not just a state mandate. So one of the most difficult and frustrating things to track in, um, in the history of Towson is the history of tailgating because it literally seems to change every year. Um, by the mid 1980s, there had been a few incidents that led the administration to try and clamp down on the tradition, uh, perhaps fearing a lawsuit as had happened in other locations. So they began experimenting with things like a dry, dry tailgate, um, and the numbers of people who uh, attended the games began to drop. Um, but there were fireworks at Burdick Hall, <laughs> Burdick Field, so, you know, everyone wants to go see those. So in, in 1986, the homecoming dance, which had still been going on for 30 years, uh, was disrupted by a fight between, like, they said they reported with 20 to 25 people. Um, student staff members who were there as part of the homecoming committee uh, actually broke the fight up before uh, the county cops arrived. I'm guessing that the uh, campus police wasn't as robust as they are now. Um, the incident pretty much served as a death knell for the dance tradition. Organizers said that fewer and fewer people had attended through the years and the cost just wasn't worth it. Um, so in 1990, the dance was replaced by a concert. Um, so this is Taylor Dane, who is a pop singer. And the tower light shows that the choice wasn't hugely popular on campus and only about 2000 people attended the performance. I will be quite honest. I was a brand new baby student on campus at this time. And I can't remember a Taylor Dane song because I didn't listen to 
pop music and I didn't go to homecoming. <laughs> and so I definitely didn't go to the Taylor Dane concert. So I was not one of the 2000 people who was there. Um, but this tradition of concerts um, on Friday nights uh, continued through the 1990s. Okay. In 1999, the tradition of crowning a homecoming queen returned, uh, but with the added bonus of crowning a king as well. So students were uh, voted on eight contenders, four for each title, and Brian Jablonski, who was also president of the SGA, won. So, so why are we looking at this photo from the tower light, which is clearly not of Jablonski as king or the queen from that year, who was Sarah Muse, just so I don't leave her name out also it's a great name um, because this is a perfect illustration of the limitations of the material we often have to work with um, in the archives. I scoured photographs. I went into the office yesterday and looked through lots and lots of photos from um, the campus uh, photo group Kanji and uh, others. I looked at student newspapers and I looked at the yearbooks and to try and find an image of that first ceremony with a new king and I came up empty. So history is written by the folks who keep it, not just the winners, my friends. So during the start of the new millennium, TU, as we were then known, starting in 1997, had a little uh, hiccup in leadership. But by 2003, Bob Corrett, who served as provost under Hope Smith, became president. Corrett strongly supported athletics and football, and during his tenure, homecoming was rebooted. Every year, the homecoming committee created different events to inspire participation by students as well as alumni. Spirit Days invited faculty, staff, and students to dress in TU gear, um, decorated campus sidewalks during chalk the walk events and students literally scream their support during yell like hell rallies. So tailgating was now seen as this necessary component of homecoming and by 1999 the school started a festival festival style event to draw alumni and their families. And there's the old tiger. That's the tiger I knew best. Uh, and the alumni office also began creating events specific for returning graduates. Uh, people could reserve tents to hold many reunions with their classmates or other student organizations. There were events during the weekend to recognize distinguished alumni and those who served as volunteers. Um, in 2000, the alumni office actually hosted the first 5K that morning of the game, and at that point it was called the Tiger Prowl. So this isn't really a homecoming picture and it's not specific to homecoming, but I think it's important to note that in 2003, the school debuted both a new mascot and an updated stadium, which was renamed the United Stadium, as we know. As for the Tiger, the school took suggestions for the name, which was voted on by the SGA. According to Pete Schlair, who, was, who has been long serving, he was the director of athletic media relations, and uh, he's a great resource for me. Um, main suggestions included Rory, which is really hard to say, Minigan, Tony, Hope, Tank, and Stripes. Now I was told at a point, I, we didn't, I didn't bring up, I didn't use a picture of him, but one of the first, the mascots during the 80s was Sergeant Stripes. And if that's true, that's where I guess stripes came from, maybe. Uh, but however, in April of 2003, the tiger was introduced, the new tiger mascot was introduced as Doc, which was a nod to Doc Minigan, um, whose uh, influence is still felt. Um, so while I call the 1960s era of homecoming one of refining, that could be said of what happened during the last decade too. Tradition, eh, traditions that have been in place have been retooled for a new generation. So in 2011, the concerts and dances coalesced into um, a Friday night block party. So students are invited to participate in games and activities to start off the homecoming weekend. And um, this picture is actually in front of New Hall, like we saw earlier, that very first dormitory that was on campus. And here you can see it must have been a lovely night and nobody, um, Everybody is gathered to do just to mingle. And back there, you can see Doc, he's hiding out in the back there. Um, in 2016, Greek organizations gathered to perform routines in CQ Arena in a competition called Dance the Madness. 
Um, this essentially replaced the yell like hell rallies. I like this one because it has a Star Trek. No, Star, oh, I'm going to get kicked out. Star Wars theme. Um, I There are videos of these routines on YouTube. You might find them entertaining. Um, and then the Alumni 5K has been renamed the Tiger Track. And there's sometimes it also includes a fun run to include children and families in the event. And this event was restarted in 2015 as part of the celebration of Towson University's 150th anniversary. Um, and alumni continue to be able to reserve tents for their own tailgating events on Saturdays, just like we saw um, in the 2000s. I, oh, there it is. I was like, I thought I put pictures. There it is. There. So here we have uh, student um, student organizations and uh, years, uh, alumni grouped by years, and they're all gathered together to uh, have a mini reunion tailgate um, on campus uh, before the game starts. Okay, so obviously we are all here because things are a little different this year. There's no game to watch, but many groups have joined forces to create a virtual homecoming week to celebrate TU and the students and alumni of this institution. So here's how we are all celebrating. There will be a block party, but it will be on Zoom. Um, the alumni office has done great work and they're hosting a virtual tiger trot and tailgate party. Um, there has been a talent show where people post videos in hopes of winning prizes. There was a virtual petting zoo where people were um, sharing their pets on Instagram. Uh, I know this is all a really strange time for us, but I appreciate all the work that's been done by the committee to try and capture some of what homecoming has meant to TU for almost 100 years. And on that note, thanks for coming to this virtual presentation. If you have questions or comments, let me know. And um, there's my email address, so you can get in touch with me after this, too. Okay. I'm going to stop sharing. Thanks, Felicity. So we did receive um, at least one comment coming through privately that I did want you to know. Um, and Mary Louise, I hope you don't mind that I share it. But Mary Louise entered Towson in 1959, which was the last class of Towson State teachers in 1963, as you mentioned. Um, and she just said, we loved homecoming and especially the parade through Towson. Uh, what happy years she spent there and she still lives in the neighborhood. So um, I wanted to share that for you because I know we were, you, you, you mentioned the class of 1963. Yes, I think that's a, those years are so, I mean, I was having a hard time just not talking about every little thing that they did because it was, it was, uh, immense the, the work that they put into making homecoming something that really would gather students as well as um, the community and um, that I think that's for a, for a school that was at that point not very big still that was a lot of work so I appreciated uh, what they did too so thanks mm -hmm. so if anyone else has questions at this time feel free or comments, feel free to add them into the chat window and just make sure you direct them to um, just all participants. The one thing that I wanted to note, um, Felicity, was I know you mentioned like the changeover from homecoming king and, and queen to king, um, but now we have the third title, which is royal. So um, it's a gender neutral title. So when you apply, you probably know about it, but for anyone listening who, who doesn't, um, you now choose what you want to run for. So you can choose to run as queen, as king, or as royal. So I think that's really um, an exciting element to, to add into our history of homecoming. Yeah, I absolutely love how, um, you know, part of what I was seeing as I was looking through this was that, that struggle to make sure that everybody felt included. Um, and that becomes particularly poignant in the 80s. And so the continued development, the continued push to make sure that everybody on campus, off campus, alumni, all understand how um, important we feel they are to Towson. Um, and we do what we can to make sure that they all feel welcome. That I think is a beautiful, a beautiful response. So I'm really, I, um, I'm glad to be part of a school that does that. Well, great. Um, I, you know, everyone just 
is thanking you for your participation today. As always, I learned a lot of new things. Uh, whenever you talk about doc and the transition from um, mascot to mascot, that's always interesting, but I hadn't heard about Sergeant Stripes. Today's the first that I've heard about him. So <laughs> I appreciate learning more about him. Yeah, he's um, he's the less fearsome, scary tiger that is part of the 1980s. Uh, we have, um, so in the office, I created a big poster board that has all the mascots on it, and some of them are not very uh, warm and fuzzy. And so Sergeant Stripes is the one who I think a lot of folks might recognize um, as the other doc or that's what he's often called by people when I take him places or when I take that poster places. But um, yeah, that was a, I was afraid, I think I was at a basketball game and somebody told me that that was Stars and Stripes. And I was like, what? <laughs> I don't understand. He had a name? You had a name before Doc? So yeah. Well, and my other aha moment today was um, I didn't know that the Tiger Trot was not the first homecoming 5K. So maybe we should have way back in 2015 named it the Tiger Prowl. I don't know. I kind of like the ring of Tiger Chat, but that was interesting to learn. <laughs> yeah, I think sometimes it's uh, when you go back in time to look at, I wish I could really go back in time, but when you go back and look at things, you see what um, what has what has succeeded and what, you, know, you just always wonder who, who came up with this and what happened. Like, why did it suddenly just disappear? But um, yeah, no, I, I like Tiger Trot too. It, the alliteration is great. <laughs> Well, great. Well, I just want to thank you, Felicity. This we will um, now conclude the presentation for the history of TU Homecoming. Thank you again, Felicity, for joining us. I hope everyone here today also enjoyed the presentation as much as I did. You can follow Felicity and the TU Special Collections and University Archives Department on Facebook and a few other um, social media channels. They're in your window now. Um, and of course, we hope you can join us for another one of our Stay Homecoming events this week. Tomorrow, we are hosting a virtual cooking class followed on Friday with a virtual beer tasting with two of our alumni brewers, and then kick off homecoming, stay homecoming weekend on Saturday or Sunday by completing the Tiger Trot Homecoming 5K in your own space and in your own way. Then stay tuned on Saturday at 2 p.m. for our virtual tailgate party. You can, of course, learn more about all of these events and all of our other events at alumni.towson.edu slash events. Make sure you follow the TU Alumni Association on our social media channels and on Tiger Connect, our alumni community. You can see those details in your window now too. Thank you again for joining us and we do hope to see you next time.